welcome uh, Athanasios Orfanides, uh, co-author of this study. Uh, the Econ Committee has requested a study on the options for the ECB's monetary policy strategy review. Following this request, uh, a study uh, was prepared by uh, uh, Ivan Lengvil, Weiler, Faculty of, for Business and Economics, University of uh, Basel, and uh, Athanasius uh, Orfanides, uh, Sloan School of Management, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, Mr. Orfanides is invited today to make a presentation of the study and have an exchange uh, with the uh, ECON members. The study touches upon several dimensions, the ECB institutional framework, the historical overview of the euro area economy, uh, the ECB's primary mandate of price stability, the broader mandate of supporting the economic policies of the EU, implementation and effectiveness of uh, policy, uh, the response to the pandemic, and eventually some recommendations. In light also of the consequences of the COVID outbreak on our economy and society, we are at a turning point of our European history. It's today the moment to take stocks of our experiences, problems and limits uh, in the Union in order to have a forward-looking approach on our policy. As this paper indicates, the European Central Bank represents the most important institution of the European Monetary Union and we should be able to create all the conditions in order to foster its mandate and actions. Some chapters of this paper are particularly interesting for our debate, for example, on the low interest rate environment, and I would actually welcome to express further reflections on this topic in light uh, of the impact on our uh, economies. The paper seems to depict uh, a scenario with some gray areas where further actions are needed according uh, to the two authors. I hope that today's discussion can be seen as an important opportunity to discuss these matters in the framework of the Econ Committee. So uh, in line with the great practices, the following procedure will uh, be applied for this exchange of views with Mr. Orfanides. There will be an introductory uh, remarks by him of 10 minutes, followed by five minutes, uh, five minute question and answer slots with the possibility of a follow-up question time permitting within the same slot. Normally we have two minutes maximum for the question and three minutes for the for the answer. And if time so allows, additional slots will be allocated on a catch the eye uh, basis, taking into account the weightings of each of the political group. So I really ask everybody to respect the time uh, given uh, to you. So I will now open the debate and I give the floor to Mr. Orfanides for uh, his speech. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, honorable members of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present the study on options for the uh, ECB's uh, monetary policy strategy um, review. Uh, as the chair mentioned in her introduction, the ECB is the most important institution uh, for the success of the uh, Economic and Monetary Union. Its record has been uneven. Uh, the ECB's policy strategy served Europe well during the first several years of its operations, but less so over the past decade. The ongoing pandemic hit the euro area economy while the adverse consequences of the euro crisis of the 2010s were still lingering, and while its strategy review was underway. The pandemic delayed work on the strategy review but we should recognize that it has made improvements to the pre-pandemic monetary policy strategy more urgent. In accordance to uh, our uh, terms of reference, uh, Ivan Lenwiller and I uh, in our study covered a number of pertinent issues ranging from an assessment of the ECB's track record in achieving its mandate to a set of policy recommendations regarding the strategy review. In the interest of time, my introduction will focus on two very specific recommendations directed at addressing two weaknesses that uh, we found stand out. The first relates to the lack of a precise definition in the ECB's interpretation of its primary mandate of price stability. Ambiguity in the ECB's primary goal has led to suboptimal policy over the past decade, 
This has been one reason why the euro area overall has performed worse than other advanced economies over the past decade. The second issue relates to the implementation of monetary policy. This is a technical issue, but nonetheless incredibly important. Flaws in the ECB's policy framework have contributed to the impairment of the transmission of the single monetary policy that we are all aware of. Monetary policy has not been transmitted evenly across member states, resulting in divergences that threaten the viability of the EMU. Next, next slide, please. The immense power of central banks is evident in their balance sheets. Only central banks have the ability to issue potentially unlimited quantities of reserves to respond to a crisis. Uh, this is immense power and an immense responsibility for central banks to do it right. Two of the major crises over the past dozen years, the global financial crisis started in 2008 and the pandemic this year have had common economic consequences across numerous advanced economies, including the Euro area and the United States. This makes comparison of ECB and Fed policies informative. Focusing first on the response to the pandemic, we see the unprecedented response of both the ECB and the Federal Reserve. In a matter of weeks, March and April, uh, the Federal Reserve increased its balance sheet by over $3 trillion. In this episode, the ECB has been all, almost as forceful. It increased its balance sheet by about $2 trillion. Euro, and this has been important and helpful response. Now, balance sheet operations such as this are critical for crisis management, but are also an important part of calibrating the monetary policy response to a recession. This is more so the case since the global financial crisis due to another common challenge, the low level of global interest rates. The secular decline in, in interest rates over the past two, three decades has presented a constraint on interest rate policy since the global financial crisis. Uh, traditional policy responses to a recession, cutting interest rates, has not been sufficient, which has necessitated central banks increasing their balance sheet by purchasing government debt and with other operations. So you can see from this slide, both the ACB and the Fed increased their balance sheet after the global financial crisis from 2008 to mid-2012. But then you can see a divergence, and this is an important divergence suggesting some difficulties for the ECB. Case of the Fed, the balance sheet expansion continued. The Fed managed to restore full employment and price stability in the United States economy. Unfortunately for Europe, we had a reversal from mid-2012 to end 2014, suggesting some problems with the implementation of balance sheet policies. Next slide, please. This um, um, issue actually has created a miscalibration of policy. Uh, policy ended up being too tight for a number of years, and the consequences of this miscalibration are evident in the path of inflation. Whereas uh, inflation during the first day, decade of the ECB uh, was consistent with uh, an inflation goal of being very close to 2%. Uh, since 2012, the ECB has led inflation drift lower. As you can see in the chart, um, the average inflation rate has fallen from 2% to 1%. This actually put the ECB in a bad position to respond to the pandemic because inflation was already too low. Um, one reason for this is the fact that uh, uh, the ECB did not have a very clear inflation objective. In order to raise inflation, it needed to expand its balance sheet by, by engaging in, in asset purchases, something for which it had faced a lot of political pressure and legal challenges. Rather than address these issues, unfortunately, the ambiguity in the mandate effectively pushed the ECB to tolerate loflation. Next slide, please. This is, a, this is a mistake that was recognized in real time, not difficult to see on the basis of standard analysis. And it's, it's important to us to realize why loflation and the ambiguity of the mandate that led to it is costly for the euro area economy. Uh, as an example, we can go back to uh, April of 2004, when the then IMF managing director, Christine Lagarde, uh, had pointed out uh, 
there is an emerging risk of what I call inflation, particularly in the euro area. A potentially prolonged period of low inflation can suppress demand and output and suppress growth and jobs. More monetary easing, including through unconventional measures, is needed in the euro area to raise the prospects of achieving the ECB's price stability objective. Now, as uh, Christine Lagarde had observed at the time, loflation meant lower output and higher unemployment. This was very costly for the euro area economy, but I want to highlight an additional cost. Uh, by pursuing loflation policies, the ECB uh, unfortunately uh, added to the fiscal stress uh, that some member states experienced in the euro area. Recall that the debt to GDP is a ratio. Uh, GDP is the denominator. By suppressing nominal GDP, uh, uh, the central bank can actually make debt situations worse. Next slide, please. The first recommendation I want to highlight uh, is that the ECB should adopt a clear, symmetric 2% inflation goal. Uh, this would make uh, uh, policy more effective and efficient. It would actually help uh, the ECB in the current circumstance by helping it be more systematic and help explain in response to the various criticism that it has been subjected to and political pressure against quantitative easing policies that the reason it means to implement these policies is to maintain inflation in accordance with its goal. If inflation rises, then, then the ECB would simply uh, undo the quantitative easing as needed. Uh, next slide, please. Let me now turn my attention to the second issue I would like to highlight. Uh, as already mentioned, flaws in the ECB's policy framework have contributed to the impairment of the transmission of the single monetary policy. To highlight this, uh, uh, let's focus on two decisions that, uh, uh, that, I, that I have on this slide. This slide plots two-year government bond yields for the four largest member states in the euro area together with the two-year euro OIS overnight index swap rate. Now, the OIS rate reflects the ECB's overall monetary policy stance, and if the monetary policy transmission worked well, then government bond yields should be similar to that. As we can see, at the start of the pandemic, uh, there was a problem with the transmission mechanism. And you can see, first of all, with the March 18 decision, uh, the pandemic emergency purchase program, that this was an important element in, in helping uh, improve the situation. But that improvement was not sustained. I want you to see that a few days later, the instability reappeared and peaked on April 22nd. It was only after this second decision that the ECB took on April 22nd, that the instability was contained. And I want to highlight uh, this, uh, what that decision was. That was a that was decision of a technical nature, esoteric, and very important. Next slide, please. Uh, it had to do with the collateral framework. What the ECB did on April 22nd was effectively suspend a bad practice in its collateral framework. The, effectively, the, the decision to delegate to private credit rating agencies collateral eligibility for sovereign debt. This was extremely in, destabilizing in the euro area, and uh, on April 22nd, uh, the ECB suspended this decision. This was a fantastic decision, very important for finding the pandemic. But let me also point out, you can see highlighted in the slide, it was a temporary measure. Uh, this is and decision that, that, that holds until September 2021. And this is a glaring shortcom shortcoming that requires urgent attention. Not addressing this issue invites yet more episodes of instability next year. Next slide, please. So the second specific recommendation we have is that the ECB should discontinue permanently using private credit ratings for sovereign debt. Among all other weaknesses in the ECB monetary policy strategy, we identify this one as the single most important for the continuing fragility of the economic and monetary union, and we hope that the ECB will take measures to remove it. Next slide, please. Let me just close by reiterating the ECB monetary policy strategy presents review presents a unique opportunity for the ECB to examine how to best employ its immense power uh, 
in accordance, in accordance with its mandate to serve the people of Europe. The ECB has shown us uh, with its actions uh, in the spring of this year that it can do much better than it did in the previous decade, especially much better than it did in the euro crisis. But to limit the lasting damage from the pandemic, we need permanent correction of some of the known flaws of the ECB's policy strategy. And we believe that this is a matter of urgency. This concludes my introduction. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Now we start our uh, Q&A session and we start uh, with uh, Danuta Hubner from the EPP. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I would like to ask you actually two questions. The, the, the first one would both actually would be related to the combination between the fiscal and monetary policy, which I believe, and probably you will share it with me, that it's one of the most difficult issues uh, right uh, now. And uh, I, I'm not sure whether the separation between the two policies is still a valid assumption for this uh, COVID and also post-COVID. Era. So my first question in this context is how relevant you think and how important for ECB monetary policy is the fact that fiscal rules in, in EMU have been suspended and will stay probably for a while in this stage. So could, could we say that the sooner they are back the better or do you think that their design really meet the purpose of the new reality? So that's one question. And the second um, also a little bit related to, to this and to the fiscal dominance uh, issue because we have the inflation of which you, you talked um, in your presentation uh, con that we see the inflation continues to be below the, uh, the target and most likely will stay like this uh, for a while and probably only if inflation raises then ECB could stop the asset purchases and also raise interest uh, rates but as long as we have those high debts uh, uh, monetary policy uh, uh, target continues to be rather to prevent government from bankruptcy, then so inflation is not really a, a, a target. So I, um, I, in this context, I mean, could, could it uh, just uh, become, could we face a situation that the inflation could start moving upward only in a situation where we will have aggregate demand really growing, which doesn't look so far that it could uh, be. So could you, could you comment on uh, around this uh, issue? Because we have the impression sometimes we which started actually with Mario Draghi a policy that the monetary policy has become a kind of hostage, uh, a kind of uh, fiscal backstop in the current uh, situation. Uh, and this situation doesn't look like it could come to a, a real change uh, anytime uh, soon. Thank you. Mr. Orfanidis, yes. Um, thank you. Um, th thank you for the uh, for the question. Uh, first, let me address the uh, uh, the uh, need to examine together fiscal and monetary policy under current uh, circumstances. Good policy always implies that the different levers must be coordinated well. Monetary policy, fiscal policy, structural policies must be coordinated. Now, this does not mean that we can have any inconsistency with the independence of monetary policy and the independence of the central bank. The ECB should be taking into account what fiscal policy is doing and should be doing what it can do to facilitate uh, uh, better fiscal policy in the process. Now, what we have seen uh, in the euro area relative to other jurisdictions is that the ECB has been implementing monetary policy in a way that has created unnecessary fiscal stress for a number of member states, as we explain in the uh, in the study. What we have seen is a situation where some member some member uh, uh, states have actually been been running fairly tight fiscal policies uh, with uh, consistent primary surpluses and still had uh, their debt ratios increase because the ECB implementation of monetary policy kept their interest rates higher than, than it should have. So this is, this is a situation where ECB monetary policy implementation flaws 
actually created problems with fiscal policy. It's very important to undo those flaws if we want the euro area to prosper, much like other economies, other advanced economies around the world. In the study, we, uh, we offer an example uh, and a comparison with Japan, for example. Japan is, is an advanced economy that faces some challenges similar to the, to the euro area, but it has not been facing uh, the, uh, uh, the fiscal stress that the ECB with its policies has effectively created for some of the member states of the euro area because the Bank of Japan is not in the business of creating that stress for fiscal policy. It, outcomes would be better in the euro area if, uh, if ECB policy actually was focused on avoiding unnecessary stress. Now, you are raising an important issue, and this is, this is the peculiarity uh, uh, that creates challenges for the, uh, for the ECB, um, the fact that we need to be much more concerned about fiscal dominance in this framework. Why? Because we do not want to have negative externalities to any member state exploiting effectively the monetary union for its, uh, for its own benefit. But frankly, I don't think we should be concerned about fiscal dominance in the euro area in light of the supreme independence of the ECB. What we should be doing is we should be encouraging the ECB to be, to be pursuing a systematic monetary policy. Right now, systematic monetary policy means that the ECB needs to be purchasing government debt, needs to be balance sheet, it's, needs to be expanding its balance sheet in order to support the economy and raise inflation. But once inflation does rise to 2%, then the ECB could relax this measure. Because the ECB is so incredible independent, I don't think we need to worry about, about fiscal dominance. Instead, the opposite seems to be the case. Fiscal dominance is a situation that, that if, if, uh, if, if, if we are concerned with it, we end up seeing high inflation. We have seen exactly the opposite problem in the case of the euro area. We have seen the ECB pursuing low inflation rather than high inflation. I would not be concerned about uh, fiscal dominance in the current context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Pedro Marquez from SND. Thank you, Chair, and thank you also to the author of the study and so clear for, for these so clear recommendations that you put forward. I would go through um, both of them basically, but the first one on the issue of the um, of the of the inflation target, the, the, the object, the primary objective. I would go more through your approach on, I would say, monetary policy flaw flaws in the implementation. Uh, knowing the current transmission difficulties of, uh, of monetary policy, what kind of different policies would you see to overcome these flaws? What kind of non-traditional measures, aside from the asset purchasing uh, programs, would you see that would be more effective? That's my first question. And the second question, it's about um, a time that I recall well. I was a minister in 2016 in Portugal at the, at the Portuguese government when Portugal faced the risk of being excluded from the quantitative easing program because of the downgrade of our public debt from private agencies. Um, so we have had this discussion in the past, but then it was again put in the, in the freeze. Nobody's talking about any other alternatives to these private rating agencies. Uh, obviously, the consequences could have been catastrophic to my country and to the European uh, and to the, the euro area, certainly, if uh, we had had all the consequences of being left out of a program like that. So my point is, what alternatives do you see or do you defend? Uh, uh, if we are to to go to other to other situation and not be kind of in the hands of these private rating agencies, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, uh, with res with respect to uh, tools that the monetary policy uh, can rely on uh, in the face of very low interest rates that constrain uh, interest rate policy, the, uh, the basic tool is, uh, is asset purchases. Yes, the, uh, the central bank can go to slightly negative interest rates. The ECB has done that. There are costs and benefits for that. Other central banks have not done that. For example, the Federal Reserve has maintained zero interest rates, never went to negative, and that has worked fine. But Federal Reserve 
as some other central banks have been much more willing to engage in decisive asset purchases in order to boost the economy. And this is what the ECB has not done uh, uh, promptly and decisively uh, in uh, several years ago. And this is what has been constraining policy policy ever, ever since. The ECB has engaged in something that is uh, uh, almost as useful, not quite as powerful, but, but, uh, but quite useful as well. This is the provision of long-term uh, uh, liquidity with, uh, with a tail trust, for example. This is the latest uh, fact they have. But really, if they want to raise inflation systematically over the next several years, uh, they need, the ECB should be more forceful with its uh, asset purchases and liquidity provision program. Not not more than that is needed. By providing, uh, uh, by providing uh, extremely low interest rates for all member states, uh, the ECB not only improves financing conditions in businesses and households, which boosts aggregate demand, it also reduces drastically the cost of refinancing um, uh, of uh, government debt for governments, which actually means additional fiscal space for governments to expand with monetary policy. And, and by the way, I should have mentioned in, in, in my response to, pre to the previous question that it's very important that we do have the suspension of the fiscal rules while we're in the pandemic uh, in order to facilitate the additional fiscal, fiscal expansion that is absolutely necessary to help the economy recover, recover quickly. Now, this is, respond this is the, in response to the first question. With response to the second question, frankly, as you pointed out, the the example of, of what happened with uh, with Portugal really reflects very badly on uh, on the ECB. The fact that we had uh, we had stories in uh, in newspapers and the media effectively making fun of the institution about saying that the ECB effectively allowed some obscure credit rating agency. One one article was mentioning an obscure credit rating agency in Toronto effectively is going to determine the uh, uh, the fate of, of Portugal for the next coming months and the implementation of monetary policy. This reflects very badly on, uh, on, 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 on this particular feature of, of ECB policy, and it's completely unnecessary. Uh, the ECB took an unfortunate decision before the global financial crisis to delegate the implementation of monetary policy, delegate the eligibility of, of government debt for its monetary policy operations to credit ratings. That decision is not consistent with best practices. That decision has been creating instability in the euro area for the past 10 years. The ECB recognized uh, that, that this instability and took the very important decision we highlighted on April 22nd to suspend the instability. The ECB should permanently stop using uh, uh, private credit rating agencies for implementing monetary policy when it comes to government debt. Government debt is just too crucial for the ECB to keep prolonging this error. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Caroline Nachtegal from Renew. From Renew. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and also many thanks to Mr. Orfanides, especially for his comprehensive uh, analysis uh, regarding the, the monetary strategy review of the, of the ECB. Uh, I'm, uh, let's start with this. I'm, 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 I'm broadly agree with, with the key, key elements of your study. And I think these perfectly uh, touch on the considerations for the monetary policy review. But let me focus uh, on, on one concern I have. If I uh, correctly understand uh, your study, you basically say in the study that uh, economic cohesion should be part of the ECB's uh, monetary policy, as reflected in the recommendation tree of your study. Um, in my opinion, uh, we cannot make uh, the European Central Bank responsible for economic convergence within the Union, although I absolutely agree with you that economic convergence is important for the stability of our monetary union. So when we look at economic convergence, I think it's the first and, and, and foremost responsibility of the national governments in close cooperation with the EU. So economic convergence is also directly related to, well, sometimes painful uh, economic structural reforms. Uh, 
And a large part of our multi-annual financial framework is actually dedicated uh, towards promoting the economic uh, convergence within the EU. So the failure or maybe also the unwillingness of any member state to take action in the regard, in my opinion, does not justify that the ECB is including economic convergence in their mandate. So I was wondering how you look at this concern I have and I'm interested in your view, so thank you for that. Thank you for the for the question. Uh, uh, in, indeed, I uh, I broadly agree with you. Uh, the most important thing is to separate what the ECB can do. Uh, I think that the the, the 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 framework that determines that price stability is the primary objective uh, of the of the ECB in the uh, in the in the euro area is, is very important. But we need then to take into account the fact that the ECB with its policies can contribute to the uh, broader objectives of the, uh, of the European Union. And among those broader objectives, the one that is very closely related to the ECB's primary mandate is economic cohesion. Why is that? This is because if the ECB allows uh, or promotes, which is even worse than allowing, wild divergences uh, in the economies of different member states, then it cannot preserve uh, uh, price stability in all member states at the same time. And while I agree with you that the first, the, the, the most, uh, the, uh, the greatest part of the responsibility for convergence actually does lie with the, uh, with the governments of the member states and their willingness to implement the structural reforms that in some cases are needed. I fully agree with that. We should not uh, lose sight of the fact that uh, uh, flaws in the in ECB's implementation of monetary policy may actually make these divergences that we have seen over the past 10 years worse. So the recommendation we have is that the ECB should be very careful not to be making the convergence process more difficult by effectively um, uh, having elements in the implementation, in its implementation framework that lead to unnecessary stress and divergences. One example is the example I just highlighted uh, before, effectively delegating to credit rating agencies the collateral eligibility of government debt, which from time to time is bound to generate crisis in some member states. It's completely unnecessary, and yet it's one of the reasons why we have gotten divergences. So overall, I agree with you that the primary responsibility for convergence and uh, cohesion is the governments, but we believe that since it is part of the secondary objectives of the ACB, and since it's the secondary objective that is most directly related to price stability, uh, the ACB should also try to the extent possible to facilitate uh, cohesion. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so now, Uh, now, uh, for the Greens, uh, I don't know if it's Sven Giegeld wants to take the floor. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your study and presentation. And uh, I have to send apology, apologies from our so-called uh, shadow, uh, Ernest Tortasun, and I read his question. Um, we would like to ask you, Mr. Ofanides, whether you think that Article 127 TFEU plus uh, Article 3 TEU is clear enough on the ECB's uh, secondary mandate, or whether he thinks there is room for improvement. Uh, for example, involving the European Parliament in the specification of the prioritization of the ECB secondary mandate. My question would also be um, whether already within the existing treaties uh, there is space for improvement in order to involve the Parliament more strongly when it comes to such a potential prioritization. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for the question. You, you are raising a very important governance issue that we uh, uh, that we uh, uh, allude to in the uh, uh, in, in the study. Actually, in the in the study, we have a comparison of the uh, 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 ECB's implementation of uh, the treaty, as is reflected in the legal authority given to the ECB in the statute. And we also give, as another example, the Bank of England's, the Bank of England's mandate from the Bank of England law in 1998 uh, is actually very similar to and respects the treaty, much like the, uh, the ECB statute. But then in the ECB's case, the bank, sorry, in the Bank of England's case, the Bank of England law has an additional article that actually clarifies that the precise interpretation of the mandate of the, uh, of the Bank of England is up to the Ministry of, uh, uh, of, of the UK. So what exactly is the definition of price stability? In the case of the ECB, the ECB Governing Council has been delegated the authority in the statute to determine what that is. Um, how should uh, the secondary objectives be prioritized between, for example, sustainable, uh, uh, growth uh, or uh, the uh, uh, cohesion or an equality or gender equality. These things, the way the statute is written right now for the ECB, this is up to the governing council of the ECB. The case of the Bank of England, it's not up to the Bank of England, it's actually up to the government. And I would actually argue that, uh, um, drawing from your question, yes, this is, uh, this is a problem with the, uh, with the governance of the, uh, of the ECB. Uh, in my view, um, the, uh, the statute has given too much uh, discretion to the governing council and too much power to interpret the priorities in the secondary mandate, which is not healthy from a democratic accountability perspective. The question is, can this be fixed uh, on its own? Well, the treaty is not the problem. The question is the statute which unfortunately is also part of the, uh, of the legislation that cannot be easily, easily addressed. So what is a, a secondary way of dealing with this thing? So as we, as we point out in the, uh, in, in the study, because there is this democratic legitimacy issue of the ECB governing council effectively deciding on priorities among its secondary mandate, we believe that uh, uh, one way to deal with this would be for the ECB and Governing Council to use its discretionary authority to come to the European Parliament and independently consult with the European Parliament, hear the European Parliament, and then take into account the European Parliament's views about how it should be looking at the secondary mandate. In our view, it would not be appropriate for the, for the ECB and Governing Council to be taking decisions on its own um, uh, with respect to its, uh, to its uh, uh, secondary mandate and, and wh where to give priorities, for example, promote technology, promote gender equality, promote the, the environment. This is not consistent with democratic legitimacy. And if the ECB Governing Council were to do, were to go in that, in that direction, I mean, frankly, I think it would raise questions about, uh, about requiring changes in the legislation to rein in the, uh, uh, the ECB Governing Council and, and, and make it truer to a narrower independent central bank. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now I give the floor to Jose Guzmao from GUE. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can see. Yes, we can see. Okay, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I would like to uh, uh, post uh, three questions. The first one has to do with um, with the in, in ECB analysis, it is very common to uh, to analyze um, developments in inflation and in core inflation. What kind of role do you think that core inflation could have in um, evaluating uh, the the fulfillment of the mandate of the ECB? Especially if we, for instance, would go for a, a symmetric 2% target, uh, 
um, uh, would it would it be uh, interesting in your perspective to uh, give some kind of um, bigger role to core inflation as, so as to uh, uh, detach uh, uh, ECB's evaluation from uh, um, uh, other kinds of price fluctuations that uh, are sometimes very significant and also very uh, short run. The second question has to do with the, uh, the policy mix. Uh, one of your recommendations is that uh, the ECB should not uh, focus on um, using its uh, competences in, or in order to pressure member states to fulfill uh, uh, fiscal rules, uh, fiscal rule objectives. I think this is a, a correct principle, especially because uh, being the ECB an independent um, uh, central bank, which is something that I don't agree with, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, it has been uh, it, at several different points uh, it had uh, an, uh, an extremely wide interpretation of its mandate, which then cannot be contested because it would put in, in question the independence of the ECB. And my point is that uh, at several uh, very important junctures, and as we speak, uh, ECB's positions on, for instance, uh, fiscal policy or even the labor market, which uh, quite recently has changed, uh, have had a detrimental effect on uh, the efficiency of the ECB monetary policy. Because to be absolutely fair to the ECB, uh, I don't think that we can charge it uh, for uh, as the main responsible for uh, um, inflation not picking up in, in recent years, because uh, uh, inflation is a product of different factors, and uh, I think monetary policy is probably the least responsible for the level of, uh, le low levels of inflation that we've been having. Uh, but this raises, of course, a very important issue, is, which is um, how can uh, we uh, if, if, we, if the ECB is independent, how can we uh, ask, uh, put the responsibility on the ECB to, uh, to achieve the inflation target when that target is also extremely dependent on fiscal policies? How can we uh, articulate uh, um, the, the necessary democratic legitimacy of uh, budget policies with uh, the, uh, the, object, the the mandate of the ECB. Thank you. Um, th thank you. Um, let me first briefly address the issue on, on core inflation versus headline inflation. The, uh, uh, what we want to achieve at the end of the day is price stability. Uh, uh, I think uh, headline inflation measures are the broadest measures. This is what the public businesses see. So uh, the, the central bank's goal uh, uh, is, is better described in terms of headline inflation. So 2% uh, headline HICP. Uh, symmetric, clear, transparent would be a very, very good measure, measure for the ECB to, to take into account. However, as you pointed out correctly, headline inflation measures can be noisy. And for this reason, there is value in also monitoring core measures of inflation. And indeed, the last few years, the ECB has adopted that. Uh, um, when the ECB started its operations, it wasn't really looking that much at core inflation measures. But in the last several years, it has been monitoring closely core inflation measures. And core inflation measures can be very useful for monitoring the underlying inflation trends and, and adjusting uh, policy policy regularly. Now, uh, where I would not agree with you is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, one of the last elements of the second question you had, which is whether um, we should uh, praise a central bank for delivering price stability and blame the central bank for not delivering price stability. And frankly, I am of the view that ultimately, even though many other factors affect short-term inflation dynamics, ultimately, central banks that control the issue of currency are solely responsible for the inflation 
trend that we see in the economy. So what the ECB, as any other central bank, should have been doing over the past uh, 10, 10 years is take into account other policies, take into account difficulties with fiscal policy, difficulties with structural policy. After taking all of this into account, calibrate monetary policy to deliver inflation close to 2%. In this very, very simple evaluation metric, the ECB did not do its job as well as it could be. And I disagree with you. I think we, we need to recognize that the ECB could have been doing better and should have been doing much better. Instead, I will agree with you with the fact that I mean, reading the introductory statements of the of the ECB really raises questions about the ECB commenting on a number of things that are not really directed to its policy. And this is good advice, uh, but it can also be unsolicited advice that, uh, if pushed to the extreme, can lead to counterproductive effects. We have seen this during the euro crisis. The ECB, unfortunately, participated, for example, in Troika programs that effectively directed governments to adopt measures that ended up being counterproductive. I agree with you that it would be better if the ECB did not actually have any involvement with, uh, with, uh, with such measures. And uh, frankly, my understanding is that the ECB has, has accepted that. And frankly, yes, there are issues and we do need mechanisms in the euro area to make sure that, uh, uh, that fiscal policy is sound. We do need that uh, in, the, in the euro area. It's just that it's not the ECB's job to serve as prosecutor, and judge and executioner in some cases. This is why, as Otmar Rissing had said in 2005, and I will, I will quote this, this is a very, very important uh, principle that I think they should be, the ECB should go back to. It is not and cannot be the ECB's role to enforce fiscal discipline and to correct uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the shortcomings in the implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact. So that one, I will agree with you. Uh, I think it would be, uh, it in the benefit of Europe uh, if the ECB went back and uh, reiterated uh, that uh, uh, that going forward it would be adhering with, with Otmar Ising's stated principles from before the crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a really a good exchange, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I have no more requests for uh, the floor, so I think we can uh, close this, uh, uh, this hearing. So thank you again, Mr. Orfanidis, uh, for your availability and uh, your work. And uh, have a good evening. And we now take a little break. Because